to Faith Promoting Rumors, the show that examines Latter-day Saint myths and culture to help Mormons understand more about themselves and build their testimonies of the restored gospel. This is episode 19, Translating the Book of Mormon, an introduction. John and Bill begin an ongoing investigation of the methods Joseph Smith used to bring forth the Book of Mormon from the text of the Golden Plates. They discuss the Urim and Thummim, seer stones, and other divining practices. Welcome to the Faith Promoting Rumors podcast. My name is Bill Stanley. And I'm his son, John. John has been a little bit sick this week and uh, working long, long hours. So it's, we're, we're a little late getting this podcast out and we apologize. Which is unfortunate because this episode deals with a topic that is so deep and multifaceted. I had no idea how huge the body of research is surrounding the translation of the Book of Mormon. Probably one of the most perhaps misunderstood epics in all of Mormondom, right? I mean, it's so important, the foundation of our religion, the foundation of the Book of Mormon, yet there's so many speculative things that have been said about it. So we're going to delve into those a little bit today, but more later on. That's right. We are amateur researchers. We simply don't have the time in this episode, nor the expertise and knowledge uh, necessary to cover everything. So today we're going to be giving a brief overview, Book mm-hmm. of Mormon Translation 101, as it were. There we go. Just covering the main topics. Okay. Because the veracity of the Book of Mormon is, well, the keystone of our religion, clearly it's undergone quite a lot of speculation, a lot of people for and against the idea that Joseph Smith was even a prophet, that the golden plates even existed in the first place. Today, we are operating under the premise that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, that he received the gold plates, and that he translated the Book of Mormon from those plates by the gift and power of God. Right. That is our firm testimony. And so we're going to base it on that and not try to decide whether this these events even happened. What we are focusing on today is how and by what means and with what instruments. So, Pop, how do you believe most members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints picture the translation of the gold plates to the Book of Mormon we have now today? If we did a survey, I think we'd find a lot of different answers. My thoughts growing up as a kid was that picture from the old missionary flip chart Uh that showed Joseph Smith as a young man, sort of with his brow furrowed, and uh, he's got one hand on his forehead, and the other hand is sort of reading along the golden plates, and then behind a curtain in the background is Oliver Cowdery scribbling away. That's kind of the way I always pictured it. Those who know a little bit about the translation know that Joseph Smith used an instrument which we call the Urim and Thummim. Right. A lot of people don't know what that looked like, but some people who have done a little bit of research will picture Joseph wearing a breastplate (laughs) and attached to that breastplate with uh, silver bows are what essentially amount to spectacle, a, a pair of glasses right. made of some transparent stones through which he peered in red from the gold plates. Right. And it came to pass that in the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, Emma, it works. I can read from the plates. But that's not all, right? There are actually other ways to look at this, some that might surprise Latter-day Saints and make them possibly a little bit uncomfortable because it's a weird image, weirder even than wearing a piece of armor with uh, some glasses attached to it. So you're referring, John, to the seer stones that Joseph Smith placed in his hat and then he placed his face up to exclude the ambient light, right? Right. Is that what you mean? Okay. So this image of Joseph sitting in a chair with his head stuck in a hat, it looks a little bit silly. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about some of the context of that. But uh, frankly, that's how most of the Book of Mormon was translated. Right, right. The thing is, Joseph Smith himself, when asked about the actual method of translation, said almost nothing his entire life. Yeah, he he repeatedly said, whenever he was asked about it, he said, I translated by the gift and power of God. Exactly. That's about all he ever really said. He 
kind of dismissed his brother Hiram, who asked him in a public meeting with some of the brethren, years after the Book of Mormon was translated, this I believe was in Nauvoo, Hiram said, well, why don't you tell us how you did it? And Joseph said it was not intended to tell the world all the particulars of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. It was not expedient for me to relate these things. And he kind of left it at that. So Joseph is fairly silent on the issue, but we do have several eyewitnesses who actually were in the room and saw Joseph Smith translating, of course, his scribes being Martin Harris, Emma Smith, his wife, and Oliver Cowdery. Mm -hmm. Uh, We also have a couple of other people who were either there or were nearby that give us some description. So this is how we know how it was done. But we run into some issues because some of their accounts, some of their recollections are contradictory or they lack details in some places. So we're going to explore that. So first of all, let's talk about the Urim and Thummim. Yeah, let's go back in time a little bit. So this is well before Joseph's time, right? Give us a little history on the Urim and Thummim, John. Urim and Thummim, or in Hebrew, Urim and Thummim, right, means lights and perfections. It's not something unique to Mormonism. The Urim and Thummim is in the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of rabbinical and Talmudic writings about it. Mm-hmm. Early Christian scholars and Jewish scholars all have lots to say about the Urim and Thummim, but there's not a whole lot known. Most scholars believe that the Urim and Thummim were two small sort of flat stones. One of them was black and one of them was white, and they were used for divination, for getting answers from on high. Okay. It's mentioned explicitly several times in the Old Testament. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim. And there are other times where it's strongly implied, especially if you're reading in the Greek or Hebrew. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if the man should yet come thither. Pop, have you seen the pictures of the ancient Israelite high priests where they have this whole get-up with the, the white robes and the hat, and they've got this breastplate with a bunch of... Right, right. I believe there are 12 stones, multicolored stones, correct? One for each of the 12 tribes? Exactly. Uh, according to scripture and legend, the Urim and Thummim were also attached to this breastplate, either embedded into the plate or they were put inside a pouch. And they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. As I said before, the Urim and Thummim were used mostly for obtaining yes or no answers. So if a convicted criminal was guilty or innocent, Hmm. or deciding on territorial boundaries, or that kind of thing. Interesting. It was like flipping a coin or using a magic eight ball. They had this object that they could physically use, and God could sort of intercede and tell them the answer. Will Andy pick me? Back in that time period, that was just kind of the way things were done, and it was not considered unusual at all, and they believed that that was the way that God spoke to them, was through these instruments. We have lots of instances throughout Scripture, and even in modern day, Mm -hmm. uh, church leaders, priesthood holders, using various instruments to cast lots, as it were. Right. Basically saying, we don't have the wisdom to make this kind of decision, so we are letting God decide for us. And the Urim and Thummim was used for that. In fact, some legends even describe the use of the Urim and Thummim through various means, spelling out specific answers. It would either shine light or there'd be some kind of glint on the various other stones that were part of the breastplate. Okay. Somehow it would be able to spell things out. Otherwise, some scholars even think that the Urim and Thummim would literally move around to spell things out. To so, form words to or form letters words. or something. Wow. Like a Ouija okay. board or something. Yeah, yeah. Hasbro's Ouija. It's fun for the whole family. <laughs> Although there's a whole lot of disagreement about how it actually worked, it's very clear that the Urim and Thummim was commonly used to receive revelation. Now, we're talking about Joseph Smith's Urim and Thummim, Mm -hmm. which is a whole other thing. We're probably going to get to this later, but it's not the same Urim and Thummim. In fact, it's probably not even that similar to the ancient Urim and Thummim of the Bible. But Joseph got it in the stone box where the gold plates also were hid. It was originally possessed by King Mosiah. Now Ammon said unto him, I can assuredly tell thee, O king, of a man that can translate the records. For he has wherewith that he can look and translate all records that are of ancient date. And it is a gift from God. And the things are called interpreters, 
been the same Urim and Thummim that was given to the brother of Jared. And behold, these two stones will I give unto thee, and ye shall seal them up also with the things which ye shall write. For behold, the language which ye shall write I have confounded. Wherefore, I will cause in my own due time that these stones shall magnify to the eyes of men these things which ye shall write. So Joseph Smith has this thing, and it's kind of weird, these odd little spectacles. This is what he used to translate at least the first part of the Book of Mormon, the 116 pages, or the, the Book of Lehi. Martin Harris was his scribe. Well, Emma Smith was his first scribe, his wife, and then Martin Harris became his scribe. So during that translation period from April to June of 1828, he was primarily using the Urim and Thummim. But those were not the only things that he used. He also had something that we now call seer stones, mm -hmm. which are not to be confused with the Urim and Thummim. So Emma Smith was in a unique position because she was the only person that was with Joseph at the beginning of the translation process and also at the end. And she has an interesting quote. Now the first that my husband translated was translated by the use of the Urim and Thummim, and that was the part that Martin Harris lost. After that, he used a small stone, not exactly black, but was rather dark in color. So the stone that Emma describes in this quote is the stone that is now in the archives of the church and that you can see a picture of. Yeah, they just recently published pictures of it. The church is being very transparent about what this stone is and what it looks like. It's actually right. pretty cool. The Church cool. History Museum has got a great display about it, and you should go there sometime. It's really quite interesting. Now, we have to remember that in early 19th century America, the use of what were referred to as seer stones or peep stones was very common. It was part of the culture of that day. Joseph was not the only one that had a seer stone. This might sound a little weird to us nowadays, you know, that they would have these seer stones, and not just seer stones, but divining rods. Have you seen these things where yeah. people like find sources of water by holding these little metal sticks? The kids will never believe. <laughs> That old Uncle Don came out with his witching sticks and found water. It's like magic. Joseph Smith and his contemporaries had very blurred lines when it came to religion, folk magic, science, medicine. To them, it was all kind of the same thing. Mm. And so the use of a seer stone was not unusual. The fact that he used one to translate these ancient records was not even questioned by his contemporaries, by new members of the church or people outside of the church. It's like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense because, you know, we all know about seer stones. He would put them in a hat. Right. And he would stick his face in the hat. And it should be noted right here before we get into it, there's nothing special about the hat. He probably just needed something to kind of close out the light so that he could look at what was emanating from the seer stone. It very likely was a top hat, which is fairly deep because there are some critics of the church who are saying that, well, if you put in a hat, it, it, the focal point was too short. There's no way that he could have seen anything that close up. But in reality, it's probably more of a deep hat. And so he stuck his face in the hat and he would dictate the words that he received from God through this stone. We also have another description from Elizabeth Ann Whitney Cowdery, Oliver Cowdery's wife, who would sometimes sit in the room as they translated. I cheerfully certify that I was familiar with the manner of Joseph Smith's translating the Book of Mormon. He translated the most of it at my father's house, and I often sat by and saw and heard them translate and write for hours together. He would place the director in his hat and then place his face in his hat so as to exclude the light, and then read to his scribe the words he said as they appeared before him. So, Pop, when I was a kid, I remember in primary, I heard that one time Oliver Cowdery wanted to play a prank or, or something on Joseph, and he switched the lenses yeah. Then Joseph was like, what's going on? I can't, I can't read this. And I thought that was a funny story as a kid. Well, let's take a look at that actual story. It wasn't actually Oliver Cowdery. It was Martin Harris. Well, and as I've learned in doing research, it wasn't even the Urim and Thummim either. The, the story that I'm about to share happened between April 12th and June 14th. Joseph was translating and Martin Harris was acting as scribe. And Martin Harris was starting to get a lot of pressure from his family and friends, thinking that he was wasting all kinds of money and time on this crazy man who calls himself a prophet, Joseph okay. Smith. And so in order to sort of 
verify to himself and maybe prove to his friends that Joseph really was a prophet as he truly believed. He wanted to put Joseph to the test, I guess. One time when they were taking a break from translation, Joseph and Martin were out skipping stones or something up by the river. And Martin found a rock that looked a lot like Joseph's brown seer stone. When they got back, Martin surreptitiously switched the real seer stone with this river rock that he found. Mm -hmm. And Joseph paused for a long time and he he couldn't see anything. They said, Martin, what is the matter? It is as dark as Egypt. Martin confessed to what he had done. And he said he wished to stop the mouths of fools, the friends of his who had been saying that Joseph was memorizing things and just reciting them out. That's an interesting story. So Joseph Smith clearly was using the stone that he had and no other, because when he put this substitute stone in there, it simply didn't work. So, Pop, we haven't really talked in depth about either the Urim and Thummim or the Seer Stones. There have been books, entire books written about each of them. Mm -hmm. But I think some of the things we've already said already have been a little bit confusing. The problem is the terminology is kind of messed up. When we say seer stone or peep stone or urim and thummim or interpreters or spectacles, sometimes we're referring to one thing and sometimes we're referring to another. And depending on whose account you're reading, there can be kind of a garbled interpretation of which is which. Joseph Smith rarely, if ever, used the term urim and thummim until after the Book of Mormon was published. Right. He would sometimes use the word seer stone. Sometimes he would use the word interpreter Mm -hmm. and refer to the same thing. And later in life, he would refer to the urim and thummim when we're not quite sure if he meant the seer stone or the actual Urim and Thummim that was in the box with the golden plates. And in fact, there are eyewitness accounts of when the translation was happening. And in the journals of those people, they would use two or three different terms describing the same object. Joseph Smith's own brother, William Smith, said this. He translated them by means of the Urim and Thummim and the power of God. The manner in which this was done was by looking into the Urim and Thummim, which was placed in a hat to exclude the light, and reading off the translation, which appeared in the stone by the power of God. So William Smith describes what we would nowadays specify as a seer stone, right? not the Urim and Thummim. Mm-hmm. So you can see why this would be confusing. Now let's make this clear. Joseph Smith had at least one seer stone with him at the time that he was translating. This was Mm -hmm. a rock that he found when he was digging a well before even he got the gold plates. Exactly. This is the the brownish, black, marbly rock that we can see pictures of online. Right. Then you have the the spectacles, and then you've got the Urim and Thummim of the Old Testament, which I believe to be a very different type of thing. Mm -hmm. Although it does have a breastplate element to it, from the descriptions that we have, they don't seem to be transparent. They don't seem to be attached to silver bows as Joseph Smith's was. I think that Joseph simply imported that term Urim and Thummim, to apply to this device that Moroni deposited into the stone box. The Book of Mormon itself describes it as interpreters, and I think Joseph himself called it interpreters on a number of occasions, but he didn't call it a Urim and Thummim until years later. In his later years, whenever he was referring to the Urim and Thummim, I don't think he was referring to a particular artifact, a particular object. I think he was talking about the Urim and Thummim in general terms. And also, it's important to bear in mind that the term Urim and Thummim has been sort of expanded to mean a lot more than an individual right. artifact. The place where God resides is a great Urim and Thummim. This earth, in its sanctified and immortal state, will be made like unto crystal, and will be a Urim and Thummim to the inhabitants who dwell thereon, whereby all things pertaining to an inferior kingdom, or all kingdoms of a lower order, will be manifest to those who dwell on it, and this earth will be Christ's. Then the white stone mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 verse 17 will become a Urim and Thummim to each individual who receives one, whereby things pertaining to a higher order of kingdoms will be made known. So the term Urim and Thummim is a much bigger, broader term than just the instrument that Joseph Smith was using to translate the Book of Mormon. (laughs) 
getting away from the actual devices of the translation, there is a huge debate we've discovered about the methodology, how it actually worked. Right. There are some who claim that Joseph literally read the words when he stuck his face in that hat, that there was a parchment or, or some kind of thing that was illuminated in front of his face where he would literally read the Book of Mormon word by word. Oliver or Martin or Emma would write it down, and then as soon as it was written, the words disappeared and new words were there, and all Joseph Smith was doing was reading. One account that we have of this is from a Presbyterian minister called Truman Coe. The manner of translation was as wonderful as the discovery. By putting his finger on one of the characters and imploring divine aid, then looking through the Urim and Thummim, after delivering this to his amanuensis, the scribes, mm -hmm. he would again proceed in the same manner and obtain the meaning of the next character, and so on till he came to the part of the plates which were sealed up. Now, obviously, Reverend Co wasn't an actual witness of the translation, but he talked to a lot of saints in Kirtland in 1836, and this is what was understood at the time by the saints and everybody around there. One of the foremost scholars on this topic is named Royal Skousen, and we actually talked to him a couple of times, yeah. but there are other respected scholars who believe that it was more like Joseph received impressions, images or thoughts in his head, which he then paraphrased in his own words, right. and that is the Book of Mormon we have today. And then some people think that it was sort of a combination of the two, where some parts, especially maybe the proper names, were spelled out literally in front of his eyes, and then the rest of it was kind of up to Joseph to put into his own words. And it's pretty clear, though, that no matter which school of thought that you follow, that Joseph Smith was truly inspired because Joseph Smith was not a learned man, and there's no way that he could put together even a coherent paragraph on his own, and yet he was able to dictate the entire Book of Mormon. So he was clearly inspired by God, whether it was an individual word-by-word -word inspiration or something else. Perhaps in the future we'll examine each of these three theories in their own right in an in-depth episode for each of them, hopefully with special guests, who sure. knows, maybe some academics who know more about what they're talking about than, than us. You know, and I think with the Joseph Smith Papers Project, there's so much academic research going on. It's an exciting time. And more and more quotes and evidence and documents is coming forth. And so we may find, you know, a lot more evidence toward exactly how Joseph Smith did to his translation in, in the coming years. This is something that we're definitely going to have to revisit with further research. But in the meantime, dear listener, if you're interested in learning more, you can read some of the books that we read in preparation for this. Mm -hmm. We have a book entitled Joseph Smith's Seer Stones by Michael Hubbard McKay and Nicholas J. Frederick. And it's a brand new book, just the last couple months, I think it came mm -hmm. out. Yeah. There's a book called The Gift and Power, Translating the Book of Mormon by Brant A. Gardner, which is also a pretty new book. And the church itself has been publishing quite a bit about this. Very recently, in October 2015, there was an Ensign article called Joseph the Seer, where the church is very forthcoming and transparent about some of these mm, interesting details about seer stones and putting his head in a hat and that kind of thing. Right. And I would encourage you, if you do read that article in the Ensign, look at the footnotes. The footnotes are very extensive, and they have a lot of very interesting details that aren't in the main article. Pop, uh, pretty much ever since the beginning of this podcast, we've been imploring our listeners to leave a rating and a review on iTunes. We've only had a couple, but we did have a, a terrific five-star review from a listener with a username Urban Wanderer, and I thought I would do them the honor of reading their review so that maybe I can persuade others to leave similar reviews. This is a fantastic LDS-themed podcast. The Stanleys have created an entertaining, thoughtful, humorous, well-produced, and most importantly, faith-promoting, as the title declares, podcast. There are so many LDS podcasts out there that cleverly and subtly preach false doctrine, or progressive Mormonism, as I've come to call it, under the guise of a well-intentioned church-related podcast. Faith-promoting rumors 
is most certainly not that. These men are not trying to lead listeners astray with pretentious pseudo-intellectual babble, nor do they have a hidden agenda. Oh, thank you. Yeah, nice. Their episodes are full of wildly interesting and well-researched information while always grounding their conversations in the gospel and their testimonies of it, maintaining reverence and respect for the scriptures and the teachings of the prophets. I absolutely love what John and Bill are doing, and I hope they're able to continue producing episodes for a very long time. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And I hope so, too. Thanks, Urban Wanderer. That was great. You, listener, can help us to continue producing great things by sharing it with your friends, maybe leaving a review, connecting with us on social media, and otherwise just being a great listener. Pop, next week what I want to talk about is a certain story that is very popular here in Utah, and it is the Miracle of the Seagulls. That sounds like a lot of fun. I I look forward to that one. Thanks for listening. Thanks. (laughs) We'll see ya. Be sure to share our podcast with your friends and family and leave a rating and review on iTunes. If you'd like to send us a comment or suggestion, email us at fprpodcast at gmail.com. Faith Promoting Rumors is a privately produced work and is not affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or any other organization. Though this series strives to provide content that is in line with the Church's official teachings, the views expressed herein are those of the podcasters and guests alone. The opinions and statements offered here do not in any way reflect criticism of the LDS Church, its members, leaders, or teachings. You've got the cancer, we've got the answer, we're stones of divination. We've got in rapture, I've read the chapter, and we're still God's creation.